There is a story in the ancient Indian fables of a man lying motionless in the roadway and his face is turned downward. A drunkard passing by assumes that he has fallen intoxicated. A thief suspects that he's trying to hide something. A hermit in turn sees a meditating saint and bows in reverence. In other words, each sees in the subject a bit of themselves. The understanding of Japanese culture over the past century has been similar. Each onlooker has seen in Japan what they have wanted to see, or rather seen a bit of themselves. Japan has been the mirror, or as the American architect Charles Moore put it, the dark waters in which Narcissus saw himself. The question, therefore, of what is Japanese about Japanese architecture is as bewildering as a Zen koan. In attempting to answer this question, one has to drift somewhere between Japan and the West, somewhere between Japan's nostalgia and utopia, and ultimately arrive at no necessarily fixed conclusion. But this cultural complexity of Japan as a collage of multiple dimensions and nuances continues to be undermined by outside eyes when compared to the many stereotypes that still seem to dominate it. I am myself an outsider to Japan in that I'm neither native Japanese nor a non-native that has lived in Japan for a major part of my life. But to state that this book is merely an outsider's perspective on Japan is unfair because I am not a casual observer of Japan either. I have been deeply engaged with Japanese architecture and urbanism for two decades through multiple extended visits, scholarship, field work, and most importantly, teaching as a form of learning. I've proposed ideas for Japanese cities, presented and discussed them with Japanese officials and professionals. And since I ended up going to Japan every few years, I feel I notice things that my friends in Japan do not social changes that take time to evolve, or physical transformations that are less dramatic and more nuanced. In turn, I know Japan well enough, I think, to see things differently from the relatively obvious aspects that catch a casual visitor. My insights on Japan, therefore, are those of an outsider, but of a particular kind. I like to think they are involved, evolving, and steeped in punctual and sharp slices of history, and this is why I believe this book stands out. What is this book about? What does it contain? The chapters in this book, first and foremost, seek to capture the breadth of the multifarious dimensions of the Japanese built environment. They traverse Japan's rich, tumultuous architecture and urban history, which has been shaped by Shinto, Buddhism, wars, earthquakes, democracy, modernism, the economic bubble, etc. And the book opens a rich discussion on the entire panorama of how the Japanese built environment has come to be. Second, the chapters trace, or at least seek to trace, which cultural threads have endured over Japanese history and which in turn have shifted, transformed, or simply vanished. Each chapter traces a thematic trajectory connecting Japan's past and present, sometimes beginning with traditional concepts and testing how they have survived today, or conversely starting with a contemporary idea and tracing its roots in Japanese history. And third, the chapters in this book seek to highlight the paradigmatic moments in Japanese architectural and urban history for either their significant influences on the Japanese built environment or their deep relevance to Japan's future. The various themes spring or engage in such crucial moments all the way from things like the import of the Chinese timber bracket, the advent of Zen, the Hiroshima bombing, and even the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. In so doing, this volume posits a larger meta-argument. Inasmuch as one embraces Japan's historical pre-industrial architecture as Japanese, we must also embrace its transitions through westernization and their mutations into new expressions and compounds because I think they are and will always also be equally Japanese. It is this extreme juxtaposition of seemingly contradictory aspects that makes Japanese architecture such a compelling study. It offers us invaluable lessons on how cultures balance and negotiate their past and present, how they reconcile seemingly conflicting cultural meanings, and how cultural identities can in fact be reinforced and renewed through successive transformation. This book argues that different aspects of Japanese culture, however disparate in our eyes, should in fact be understood as co-evolving counterparts of a larger reality. And so this book claims that the Japanese built environment we see today, 
despite all its seeming fragmentation and disjunction, is in fact one single unprecedented cultural continuum in which seeming contradictory things and events tend to mysteriously coexist. So that's the thesis of the book. What I want to do now is take you through the 11 chapters very briefly to highlight some of the key findings where I think things have been missed, exaggerated, so on and so forth, or perhaps understood. Just want to say it's a great pleasure, particularly speaking to a crowd like this. I teach, so I give weekly lectures at USC. But they're very different because you're talking to students or you're talking to faculty. But it's really wonderful to be talking to a section of society. What I love about it is we all know Japan through our own eyes. We all know slices of Japan, some maybe just general impressions, some maybe through deep reading, some through profound visits, and some who I know have lived in Japan are Japanese and, and now having come to Los Angeles. So in this room itself, there are multiple understandings of Japan, and yet none of us knows the complete truth. And that's what's so beautiful about trying to understand the culture. So my first chapter is called Between Ise and Katsura. For many of you that might not know this, if you ask a a, no, a, a novice scholar on Japan, is someone who's deeply interested in beginning to get into Japanese history, uh, what according to him or her is the most archetypal paradigmatic building or emblem of the Japanese built environment, uh, they would inevitably perhaps point to what is called the Issei Shrine. The Issei Shrine is a Shinto shrine uh, whose common image is actually the one that you see to the left there. Uh, it's a in a prefecture called the Mie Prefecture. It's an ancient wooden shrine going back, going back 3,000 years. And what's so peculiar about this shrine, at least from Western standpoint, is unlike our conventional notions that tend to build for permanence, this Shinto shrine is actually rebuilt every 20 years in an elaborate ceremony called the Shikinen Sengu. But I'm showing you Issei and Katsura because the Westerner's image of Japan, at least the Westerner's scholarly image of Japan, uh, is founded, or at least has been founded over the last 50 years or so, or more than that, on these two buildings. And the culprit of that constructed Japanese view is actually a European by the name of Bruno Tott. 1933, a well-known German architect by the name of Bruno Tott uh, visited Japan for the first time. And uh, he did not know anything about Japanese architecture. And he was a very celebrated architect, a very celebrated professor in Germany. He had students from Japan that he had taught in Germany. And so the very next day of his arrival, two of his students took him to two buildings, the Issei Shrine and the Katsura Villa, within two or three days of each other. And what happened is, as Bruno Tort saw these buildings, he had never seen anything like this in the Western world before. There was a kind of a sublime austerity about them. There was practically any lack of obvious ornamentation the way we would associate with Baroque or Renaissance buildings. And so it was also in the time when world architecture at large was also undergoing a paradigmatic shift with the advent of modernism with a capital M, where ornamentation in buildings was actually being considered passe and buildings were called kind of taking on a more austere look through new materiality particularly in Germany and Europe. And so this appealed to him enormously because it was kind of a epiphanic confirmation to him that what modern architects were trying to do in Germany by keeping ornament away, the Japanese, at least in these two buildings, had done ages ago. And so he wrote about it. He wrote about it unabashedly, comparing the Issei Shrine to the Acropolis of Greece, counting it as the archetype in the same way as the Parthenon on the, on the hill in Greece uh, symbolizes Western culture as a whole. And then for the longest time, that influential proclaim came into the West and left the entire Western hemisphere with this impression that Japan is all about austere tatami mats, these austere buildings, and so on and so forth. And this is an imprint that has very sadly remained in the dominant image of Japan. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. So the first myth I'd like to break today is that the Issei Shrine is not a building. The Issei Shrine is actually 60 buildings and two complexes that you see right there. There is the Issei Geku and the Issei Naiku, which are about five kilometers apart. 
And each of these buildings contains structures, all of which are completely dismantled every 20 years and taken apart and rebuilt. So the first misconception the world has is Issei Shrine itself. This book actually spells out one of the key things of what Issei Shrine means. The significance of Issei Shrine, however, cannot be underestimated in Japanese history. It is one of the few shrines today. The book actually discusses how the rituals of the Issei Shrine actually continue down to this day. Uh, a very elaborate set of rituals that actually pay homage to four geographies in Japan. The geography of the river, the geography of the mountains, of the fields, and of the forests. And to keep it short, basically you have more than 100 rituals from the felling of trees to the transportation of logs to the planting of fields to the seasoning of wood, all of which take 20 years. And finally, the elaborate ritual of coming to the shrine and rebuilding these entire 60 structures all the way from storehouses to temples. It's an unthinkable act of great national significance even today. Uh, and as I will talk later with its own dilemmas. But Issei is important. It's just not the most important thing in Japan. Because when you look at the panorama of Japanese architecture, you begin to see the richness and the diversity of it. You have buildings that are some of the largest wooden buildings Japan ever gave us, and probably the world has ever seen. You have buildings that are gilded in gold and lacquer, buildings that have enormous bases in stone, which are plastered in white and timber, and so on and so forth. So what I do in this book is I go through all the periods, and give you a synopsis of Japanese history, and I conclude basically that there are five fundamental architectural attitudes in Japanese architecture. The first one is a primitivist attitude. The primitivist, this is a, a Shinto shrine called the Himukai Daijingu. Uh, what you can see is the major aesthetic of this stems from thatch and huts. It's a very rustic aesthetic comes from very rural cultures. And this primitivist look is what Japanese, one side of Japanese architecture is really about. The second aspect of Japanese architecture is a structuralist attitude, uh, where the seeds of Buddhism come in. And with it comes the Chinese timber bracket. And with the timber bracket, just like the Gothic buttress that actually made cathedrals very tall, you now have buildings that have enormous spans and can have huge spaces all in raw timber. So this is an aesthetic where you have the structure of the building revealed on the outside, the timber brackets, the rawness of the buildings, the actual size of the trunks, the massiveness of scale is equally Japanese as the Himukai Daijingu you just saw. The third one, which is utterly contrasting, is a pictorial attitude. We usually don't associate Japanese architecture with color. But it's very colorful. It's a very, very colorful culture. If you can see beyond their austerity into even the colors of the kimonos or the maple leaves that you see around you. So there's an attitude in Japan where you actually color the wood, primarily for reasons of preservation. It's, a, it's a for, a, for a keeping the wood alive longer. But it gives you an aesthetic of architecture, which is very different. The fourth one is the advent of Zen, which creates a kind of the stereotypical image of the tatami room, very devoid of any kind of ornament. And I'll talk about this more. The fifth one, which is the most misunderstood one that people miss all the time, is the Baroque, what I call the Baroque of Japanese architecture which you see in shrines like uh, Toshogu Nikko Shrine or the, or the Nishi Honganji and the Higashi Honganji temples. They're magnificent temples built in wood with a riot of ornament that could actually rival some of the great Rococo temples in the Renaissance. So at least five attitudes the book really calls out and basically argues in the introductory chapter. It's a complete misconception to think of this austere stereotype that is plagued falsely, the impression of what Japanese architecture is. By stripping that away, the book then goes into various aspects of Japanese architecture. And that's what we talk about next. Second one is the culture of wood. There's no other culture in the world where the singular choice of designing traditional cities, buildings of any kind, was actually an impermanent material. It's kind of a counterintuitive thought. Why would you design cities or homes with the knowledge that they would be burned over time or be destroyed over time, again and again. So the book gets into speculations of why Japan did this. This is a very difficult question because the Japanese knew very well how to build in with earth. If you actually look at the, the mausoleums of the early emperors, they're actually made of earth. They're massive mounds of gigantic earth, massive pieces of engineering, which actually proves to you that there was a tradition of building in earth. 
Second is if you look at the stone bases of the castles that I just showed you some, some slides back, you can see that they knew how to build in stone as well. But what's surprising is all the way from the simplest house to the gigantic bulwark of resistance like a castle, you always chose wood as a material. So the uh, book gets into speculations and research. And Jared Diamond, who's here at UCLA, who's written this wonderful book called Collapse, Why Civilizations Chose to Rise or Fall, you might have heard of it, has a very interesting chapter in Japan in which he argues that uh, one of the reasons perhaps Japan chose timber is number one, it was a mountainous region, that abundance of forests and so on. But you also have to remember that unlike many other cultures where the fauna of uh, a region uh, was detrimental to keeping these forests alive, Japan's fauna actually uh, was counterintuitive to this. So as a result, you had plenty of wood. Wood was never an issue. And so people began to use wood all the way from ancient times. Of course, if you ask an engineer, you'll get a slightly different answer, which is an extension of Jared Diamond's answer. Seismic geography had something to do with it as well. Uh, Japan has a lot of earthquakes. It makes a lot of sense to design a building that's much lighter rather than a stone building. Uh, the Anasazi Indians in New Mexico actually pursued a very similar wisdom, which I call out in the book. If you look at any of the Anasazi pueblos, because it was very hot outside, they would design the walls of their pueblos in massive earth or stone. But the roofs of these pueblos were always designed with light wood because they knew that in, in Taos or other places when you have snow, the roofs would collapse. And it would just be very easy to put the roofs up back again. If they designed the building, the roofs out of massive stone, the stone would have killed the people. So there was a certain wisdom in using wood, but we still don't know the exact reason why wood was the only material that was used in Japan. So the second chapter speculates, gives you a panorama of the celebration of wood architecture, the accomplishments of wood architecture in Japan. And the paradigmatic moment here is the advent of the timber bracket, which was a Chinese Tang dynasty import that came into China. And what it did is it changed everything. Before the advent of the timber bracket, all that you had in Japan was a series of columns and beams. And the roof spans, the room spans were actually very limited to the span of the wood. But once you had the timber bracket, what you could now do is the timber bracket could span a, a, a column and, and, and extend the series of brackets so that the roof actually came out much uh, beyond the column. And as a result, you have colossal buildings that were now possible that were not possible before. Uh, you can't see this very well here, but this is a typical section of a pagoda. It actually gives a little bit of a raison as to why Japan might have considered wood as a material. What is so beautiful about a Japanese pagoda is that it's actually structurally one member, a single tree trunk, as you can see right there, right in the middle, which is hinged with, on a stone foundation below here. And everything else in the pagoda is actually cantilevered from that central column, which is a very intelligent piece of architecture. Because in an earthquake, if it shakes, you now have a, a single pivot that, that holds the whole building. Uh, rather than, it's like a waiter holding a tray in one hand versus two hands. If he trips, the chances of him balancing that tray are better if he holds it in one hand rather than two hands. If he holds it in two hands, it's a guaranteed fall. So the Japanese knew that very well, and, and, and part of the idea of the structure and the timber, timber synergy comes from there. But there are a number of things the book calls out in the second chapter. The biggest one is what we call the crisis of timber. Not too many people know that during the era of uh, the Tokugawa, this is something Jared Diamond has discussed extensively in his book, uh, Tokuga, the, uh, circa 1600s. The, there was a sort of a megalomaniacal uh, campaign to design uh, massive buildings, massive temples, massive castles, a kind of a provincial competition among various shoguns and, uh, and uh, rulers to out, outdo each other. And so you had massive temples like the Honganji temples in Tokyo. You had massive capitals that were moved from uh, like Kyoto to Tokyo and so on and so forth. What happened is, as a result is a completely unknown side of Japan that we call out in the book is Japan had a massive uh, forest depletion. It was almost on the point of critical collapse uh, and if they had not passed what we point out as the forestation policy that the Tokugawa brought in, Japan would probably not have been there today the way we see it. So the point this chapter makes is while a lot of authors and scholars glorify Japanese timber architecture as it should be because it truly gave us some of the most beautiful astounding wooden buildings in the world, we should also not be apologetic to understand that a call out 
that Japan has paid a price for this timber consumption. Uh, and that there was a, this incredible fulcrum in Japanese history where it would have been a completely different culture if the emperors and the rulers had not recognized the price they were paying for it and passed policies of planting more wood, cutting down the building, and so on and so forth. And you can see uh, in these slides uh, two aspects that call out the presence of this culture today and the dilemmas that this culture has today in Japan. The diagrams here show you how the forests around the Ise Shrine, where originally all the wood that was used every 20 years to build the Ise Shrine came from the 1,000 hectares of forest that were right around the shrine. It's a very microcosm of sustainable ecology. What's happening today is because of urbanization, the shrines, the forests are actually depleting. And you can see the footprint of gray growing. And as a result, the forest cover completely going away. The second thing that has happened around Ise, which is probably the most emblematic place to discuss Japan's wooden architecture because you keep building in the same way every 20 years, is the soil because of the wars and so on has been contaminated. So even though the timber grows, the trees grow every 20 years, the quality of wood is not the same. And you cannot build the kind of massive buildings or even the simple structures that you built 20 years ago. And what you can see here, though, is that there is a very difficult decision that Japan has to make over the next many years to come. The first is whether or not the future of the Issei Shrine should continue the same way. Because what a lot of people don't know is all the wood that this shrine is built in every 20 years comes from 5,000 miles away today. Japan spends billions of dollars every 20 years to reconstruct it and keep an ancient tradition alive. A question that many scholars, including myself, raise is, is this a sustainable practice for the future of this country? And that we need to raise very serious questions on what rituals mean. In order to validate this question, uh, I investigated a, b a bunch of Shinto shrines. And we found some fascinating answers. There are many hundreds of Shinto shrines in Japan. Issei is one of them. Uh, all Shinto shrines have had the practice of reconstructing themselves every few years. But in response to depleting timber, many shrines have adapted differently. So you have a shrine like the Izumo shrine, which is a very ancient contemporary of Issei shrine. Instead of building itself, rebuilding itself every 20 years, it now rebuilds itself every 60 years. And instead of rebuilding all the structures, it only rebuilds a few. There are other shrines that only rebuild the roof. There are other shrines that completely stop the practice of rebuilding. Issei continues it, but at a very heavy price. And so the book asks the very serious question that Japan has to contemplate this in a very significant way. Second thing it calls out is at the same time, all these wooden structures that you see today, not a single one of them is original. There is no original wooden building surviving in Japan today. All of them have either been rebuilt in time or they've been replicated or damaged. But that's not, there's not a single original uh, timber building. Which brings two questions to mind. One, that the notion of permanence doesn't have to do with the object. It has to do with the process. So the way Japan understands permanence or preservation is very different from the way we in the West understand it. Uh, we have hundreds of historic preservationists trying to preserve the exact authentic plaster of a building here. But in Japan, uh, because it's made of timber, you simply take the building down. But what remains consistent is the technique of construction, the process, and the means with which the building is built. So there are many ways of understanding this. But the other point is, how does Japan preserve the heritage of its timber architecture that exists today? You're going to need a ton of timber to preserve the thousands of buildings, the pagodas and the temples, as they decay and as they will have to be built again. So it's a very critical question that Japan has to encounter, and this book calls it out in the second chapter. The third chapter, we go to what I consider to be perhaps the most significant moment in Japanese history, which is the introduction of Zen. Before the introduction of Zen, uh, Japan had a very different aesthetic ability, which was largely about massive temples with colossal statues of the Buddha. The most monumental architecture was sacred architecture, right? like the great churches of the Renaissance. The advent of Zen, two aspects change. The first one is the the intellectual rigor shifts from temples to monasteries. 
which become great grounds for study. And, and this is a painting of a monastery. And what you can see is this monastery has all the buildings. This is a typical structure of a Zen monastery. There's an axis typically where you have all the, the major public buildings right in the middle. And then the cloisters and the, the clergy where they live actually are in these tiny little compounds. But if you trace Japanese history, you recognize that in these modest little compounds, there are two major shifts that happen from an architectural standpoint. The first one is in the Japanese interior. You now get what is called a shoin. A shoin is a study room. A study room that develops an aesthetic of being completely austere. This is the prototypical image that you have of Japan. If you go to the Huntington Gardens or any, pick up any book on Japan, you'll find this image. But the origins of this image go to a Zen monastery where you have an abbot's quarter or a monk's quarter, a very austere, bare little room. And there's a study window, a desk where he studies. And the only ornamental space in the room is what's called the tokonoma. It's an alcove where the monk chooses to put a scroll, which is called a kakemono, where he celebrates either a haiku or a poem written by a Zen master, or just celebrates the fact that there's spring is changing into summer, or summer is changing into autumn. There's this kind of innate contemplation which gives birth to things like haikus and calligraphy and so on and so forth. Many of you know, I'm sure. At the same time, what happens is the garden that adjoins these rooms also begins to change. And that's where this discussion gets so interesting. Before Zen, all the gardens in Japan are more like the Huntington Gardens that you go to here. You actually wander through the garden. You appreciate the koi, you take the ponds in, you take the water, you take the, the weeping willow. It's a beautiful experience of meditation through walking. What happens with Zen is that the priority of meditation now shifts from being kinetic to absolutely static. Zen monks practice a form of meditation called Zazen, in which you sit absolutely motionless facing the wall, or at least you focus on a single image, uh, sort of an emulation of Bodhidharma, who was the, the Zen patriarch who brought uh, Zen to Japan. Anyway, what happens as a result is every abbot's quarter, every monk's quarter now opens into a tiny little garden. Now, this garden is very unique. Unlike any Western garden in tradition, it's not a garden you can walk in. It's not a garden that has any water. It's not a garden that has any flowers. It probably does. Some of them don't even have any plants. It's a garden that is meant just to be looked at. It's kind of strange from a Western standpoint. I mean, we know about this today, but you can encounter the first Westerners looking at this and being completely perplexed. And how can you have a garden that I cannot walk into? And this garden is what creates a whole other compound in Japanese architecture that we now call the Shoin Gardens. So the third chapter actually takes you through the various experiences of how Zen monks created these beautiful gardens. And they were never one shoe fits all. And this is what I dispute uh, many of these books that have come out on Japanese gardens where uh, with the exception of very few that are really profound and I think I've in mentioned them and, in, and they've influenced me in my studies most of them are essentially of the impression that Zen gardens are about you know raked sand a few rocks a wall well nothing could be further from the truth Zen monks never followed any the rules of garden making in as much as they did, although there were books like Sekoteki that actually wrote rules on how to make Zen gardens, they were always up for experimentation. So if you look at the most the, the panorama of Zen gardens, you'll find an incredible array of complexity. You have gardens like the most famous garden in the West, which is the famous garden of Roanji, which I actually tend not to mention too often in the book because every Westerner knows this garden as the equivalent to the Issei Shrine in Japan. Uh, it's a beautiful garden, but it's not the only one. But what's so famous about this garden is it's a, it's a garden of about, uh, I think it's about 500 square feet with 15 rocks and a bed of raked sand. And that's it. You sit right here where I am and you look at this picture and you meditate on it. But there are other gardens that are completely a riot of color and water. And one of the theories this book brings out is what a lot of people don't understand is there is a relationship between why the garden became dry. In many in the medieval era, and particularly in the, in the Kamakura, in the Momoyama periods, particularly in the Momoyama era when these gardens were coming to light, there were a lot of wars. It was a war-filled period in Japanese history. And as a result, 
many of these monasteries fell into kind of uh, economic uh, downfall. Uh, they could not maintain water bodies. It was very expensive to make gardens that were so exuberant. And so I like to believe, along with a few other scholars, that this minimalist sand garden was not just an aesthetic notion, it was a practical device to keep the same principles alive of meditation, but actually cater to a very tumultuous period where you could simply not afford to have the kind of gardens that were going on. But there are many other techniques. Uh, there's a famous technique called shakke, where you cannot see it very well, but mountains, distant mountains actually frame. This is the garden of Shodenji, one of the very famous gardens. Uh, where actually, the famous mountain called Mount Hie is actually framed by these trees and by the, by the, by the frame of the hedge and captured as an image for meditation. And then this is my favorite garden in Japan, the garden of the Hosenin, the Sun Zenin Monastery. And when I sit here, this is the way Zen, Zen monks meditated, you sat here. And if you, know, if, you, if you focus at an angle on this garden, and you're taking the garden as a continuum, it actually doesn't make sense. Because the way the garden is designed is there's a 300-year-old oak tree, a massive oak tree, that is growing there and supported. A very masculine image of, of, of uh, an oak, which is the feminine image of bamboo. There's a complete contradiction that you're supposed to meditate on one thing at a time. And then there are gardens that mean different things to us versus monks. So for example, if you look at the garden of Daisenin, when a monk meditates on this garden, he's actually taking a journey through the mountains onto the water, sort of a symbolic pictorial journey of life and finally attaining, the attaining of enlightenment when the ocean calms. Versus, uh, the, for example, the monastery of Tenryuji, one of the earliest Zen monasteries built in Japan, where the mountain Arashiyama, which is in the background, actually has nine symbols on it, which the monks can read, but you and I can't. So the point I'm making is, many of these monasteries were not just situated as places in themselves, they were situated in relationship to distant natural features. So can you imagine, for instance, your house or your church or your temple or whatever, you know, not just as its own world, but actually the fact that you're supposed to take in the, when you enter a premise or a complex, you're supposed to look between two buildings at a distant mountain. And that mountain is part of the complex. And that you're supposed to experience it as part of the spiritual message that you're bringing in. Why am I saying this? Because it has enormous significance to planning today. See, what's happening today is while many of these gardens are being preserved, these mountains are being ravaged by development. So all of a sudden, what used to be a view that the monk would contemplate on is today being obliterated because you don't recognize that these gardens were not just about relationships in themselves, but also relationships to the natural geography. It's like looking up at Mount Wilson in Pasadena to the north and you know, standing at Huntington looking at that and believe, imagine that Mount Wilson was part of the pictorial garden making of a Huntington garden. And all of a sudden you have a massive radio tower that shoots up from Mount Wilson. And these are the kind of nuanced aspects that we need to bring out because you talk about preservation, deep scholarship can bring out many things that we don't see. And then the, during the Momoyama period, the discussion shifts to one final prototype of Japanese garden, which we call the Roji, which is actually the tea ceremony garden. Many of you have heard of the tea ceremony. We can talk about it later if you want. But in principle, what fascinates me is these gardens actually tell you how open-minded how unique Zen was to experiment in various ways. For example, in the Shoin Garden I just shared with you, the basic experience of the garden is that you sit in one place motionless and you look out into a garden. If you look at the Roji, it's exactly the opposite, but it's equally Zen. You basically walk through a garden, then you go into a hut where you sit absolutely motionless and you drink tea. So it, it just reverts the whole idea completely. But, uh, and so the point is, that while there are prototypes of gardens, it's very important that we don't stereotype them. They're saying, this is a Zen garden, this is not a Zen garden. It's a very complex, nuanced subject that goes through many, many layers of history. The fourth chapter is my personally favorite chapter, uh, because this has not been written about anywhere, and it's the most speculative, I think. Many of you might know the paintings of Pierre Mondrian. Uh, Every time I went to a Japanese room and I meditated in them, I could not but think that I was looking at a Mondrian. Because 
all that room had was straight lines. There was never a curve. There was never a curved surface. Uh, there's very little ornament. I'm talking about tatami, shoined rooms, the ones I just discussed. Every time you enter a Zen monastery, mon monastic room, and you sit there and you try to be a Zen monk, you realize you're kind of meditating on a colorless Mondrian painting. So I began to explore, was there a connection? Of course, they were not contemporaneous at all. <laughs> Mondrian was a man of our times, and Zen gardens were much before. However, was there a connection? Was Mondrian influenced? Were there any kind of philosophical underpinnings that were common? I was not the only scholar that uh, obviously had thought about this. There were mentions in many books that people, including Arthur Drexler in the 1930s and 50s, had written one of the first major books on Japan. And actually, there's a line in that book that says they're Mondrianesque competition, uh, compositions, which actually is very encouraging to me personally. But what I try to do in this book is elaborate this phenomenon, come to terms with what are the similarities. So, for example, the first similarity, I think, is when you look at Zen rooms, Zen monastic rooms, I posit they're actually much more pleasing to look at standing frontally than at an angle. In a Western room, I think a Western room, by Western, we should be careful. Uh, if you take a classic Renaissance room with objects, beautiful paintings on the walls, tables, or a British room, the Victorian room, you enter a room, you can look at it frontally, but actually I think the beauty of a room like that is to walk through the room. You have objects that are in the middle, statues, so on and so forth. It's the field of space between that makes it so interesting. If you look at a monastic Zen room, I think you sit in an angle, it's quite meaningless. I think what's so beautiful about it is to sit in front of a wall. And if you take a photograph, sorry, if you take a photograph of the same tokonoma at an angle versus frontal, at least for me, I think this is a lot more pleasing. The second is, unlike Western doors that open at an angle, so if I'm opening my window and now I take a photograph of it, two of the window panes have a perspective vanishing point by default, but not in Japan, never in Japan, at least in the ancient times. So all of a sudden, you have rooms that are exclusively sliding. So no matter if you stand frontally and take a picture of a Japanese room, because of the sliding nature of the doors, you're always looking at straight lines. You're never looking at an optical angle. It's kind of very interesting to me that they never entertained doors that were, it's all speculation, but. The third one is when you look at many Zen rooms, this hardly continues around the room. It's almost like every room is a separate composition in itself. And when you dig into how these rooms were actually made, they were made through a technique called okoshezu. And what okoshezu does is the, each, each uh, composition was actually drawn on, on, gr on the ground. Uh, so you would draw this composition on the ground, this composition on the ground. You would make these four walls. And then you would build them as if there was a carton that was being folded into a room. In other words, every wall was being thought of as a separate visual composition. And again, you know, if you, there are exceptions where paintings go all around the room, but even then I argue that taking a photograph of the room like this is hardly as interesting to me as a photograph of a room like that. And that's where you get the Mondrian. So every time I meditate on rooms like this, I remember Mondrian because of my Western underpinnings. And so what we landed up doing is taking all these various Japanese rooms, tea rooms, Zen monastic walls, and abstracting them as Mondrian compositions. If you actually take all the color out, and you begin to just draw the lines of the mullions, you begin to see there's a lot of similarity. Now, why is this important? It's very important because if you read the first chapter, the first line of this, of this chapter, that's where this chapter gets very significant. In 1960, photographer Yasuhiro Ishimoto, in collaboration with architect Kenzo Tange, published a very famous book titled Katsura, Tradition and Creation in Architecture, with a foreword by the eminent modern architect Walter Gropius. In presenting the by then celebrated Katsura Villa as an iconic Japanese paradigm, the authors had omitted the aristocratic retreat's architectural dynamism virtually abstracting its buildings into monochromatic photographic expressions. While many photos captured the Shoin's facades, 
They were intentionally cropped, erasing the elegant camber roofs and trees integral to the language of the building. Every nonlinear element that connoted access was intentionally excluded. Any feature with rich formal implications was left out. The camera only focused on the surfaces that defined architectural space, tatami, shoji, ceilings, all planar elements that were articulated by linear motives and nothing else. This deconstruction was a significant polemic for its time. And true to their word, the authors confessed in the book by saying, this is a visual record of the living katsura as it exists in the minds of an architect and a photographer. We who have made this record may conceivably be accused of dismembering katsura and those who come to know the place from pictures given here may well be disappointed upon actually visiting it. The point is, when this book came out, and I have this book, it's a very rare book, uh, there was a lot of criticism because a lot of people felt that by giving a selective image of the katsura and taking the image of the roofs and everything away, but just showing the building as a series of Mondrianis compositions, the authors were trying to sort of create a Western bias or a modernist bias in a time. They were trying to push a modern agenda in Japan. So many of the traditionalists were kind of infuriated. What this essay argues or tries to argue is if you actually begin to understand this phenomenon, they were not necessarily only doing that. There is a huge tradition in Japan where this whole idea of Mondrianist frontality has been part of a very ancient lineage. And so the book sort of calls that out, and that's the significance of that piece. Fifth chapter gets into a very beautiful theme uh, of space and time. More than any other culture I have encountered, never seen a culture celebrate time in a way the Japanese have. Uh, every culture celebrates time in its own way, every festival, the fact that we wear woolen clothes in winter and you know, lighter clothes in summer is a celebration of time. Uh, in medieval times, uh, the day, the liturgical day was divided into the Compline and the Matins by the medieval monks, so you had notions of time. Point is, however, that if you look at Western history, particularly in the fine arts, the idea of seeing the world was largely a Euclidean idea until the Renaissance. Because you have to remember that there, it was a Renaissance period that brought us the idea of perspective. So if you go to the Norton Simon Museum, you'll see these beautiful paintings, Renaissance paintings, and each of the paintings, you know, you'll have this vanishing point where the buildings are vanishing into the background. What's far away is small. What's in front is bigger. And it's kind of an innate realism, which we call Euclidean. It's got length, breadth, and height in a two-dimensional frame. But it does not have time. And when you begin to look at Japanese paintings, particularly the paintings of Hokusai, or Hiroshige, which were done at around the same time, there was less of a priority of space and depth, more about time. Uh, if you look at Hokusai's famous views of Mount Fuji, uh, it's actually the theme is just a mountain, Mount Fuji. But the, the mountain is captured from various standpoints of the city and actually shown in various seasons. If you look at the 58 stations of the Tokaido, 55 stations of Tokaido by Katsushika Hiroshige, it actually has a series of slides as if you were taking a camera and going on this journey and the time is changing over time. One of my favorite uh, aspects is, this, is a scroll, a medieval scroll in Japan that actually has the Tokaido, which is the road from Kyoto to Tokyo. It actually shows a serpentine map of a road. But what's so beautiful about it is Mount Fuji appears twice in the drawing. It's quite unthinkable for a Westerner. I mean, how would you walk from, Edo, uh, from Kyoto to Tokyo and capture Mount Fuji twice. It doesn't make sense because we are obsessed with the physical city. What they are obsessed with is how you experience the city in time. So if I'm going from Kyoto and I see Mount Fuji once, I map it. If I reach Tokyo and I see Mount Fuji again, I map it. So I'm mapping time. I'm not mapping space in the Euclidean sense. And that's what this, uh, this chapter is about. It gets into where this principle came from and how it manifests itself today in a beautiful way. Uh, kimonos, for example, uh, is, is a, a, a very beautiful art. It's a, it's, a, it's a very deep art in Japan. Uh, people choose their kimonos uh, based on seasons. Uh, the patterns of a kimono have a lot to do with how you wear it and why you wear it, and so on and so forth. Uh, the notion of patina is something the Western world 
uh, is, is beginning to learn, I think, from Japan a lot, or has learned. Uh, there's a beautiful line in the famous book by Junichiro Tanizaki, where he says, you know, most Westerners who come to his house scold him for not polishing his brass. Because in the Western world, if you don't polish your brass, you're kind of considered uncouth, maybe. But in Japan, uh, it's the patina, it's the aging of the metal that actually brings it greater beauty. So it's a celebration of time, not necessarily the object. Uh, I call out another beautiful thing, which is called chirari or chirachira in Japan, which is a very unique notion called the instant. It's a Zen notion where in Zen, unlike other, many other faiths, the notion of enlightenment is not a path, is not the destination of a long journey. Enlightenment comes in Zen any time. It could come in a latrine. It could come as you're picking a pail and you see a moonlight reflecting in it. Enlightenment is a moment that comes and goes and you go to the next one. Point is that the celebration of that sliver of moment is beautiful. So when you think of a Zen calligrapher, who does a brush stroke but never returns back because he's celebrating the time, just that one instant. When you think of a haiku, uh, a haiku like uh, crow flew off, twig trembling. Uh, it's capturing an instant of time. And that's what's so beautiful about these conceptions of space. Uh, and, and it manifests itself in physical objects as well because there, there are these potteries in Japan, for example. But the inside of the bowl, it's actually more decorative than the outside. Uh, you'll probably never see the inside of a bowl when the food is in it, but as you're picking the food, the glimpses of that beautiful inside. The inside of many kimonos is more decorative than the outside. So there are many subtle gestures of capturing the instant. And then you can see that the notion of time is actually found in Japanese space as well, where you, within a, the, the, the sort of permanence of a Japanese room, you change the scroll every season, every few days. Uh, in traditional Japanese houses, uh, you never had rooms that were called living room, or dining room, or bedroom. All rooms pretty much looked the same. The only difference was bedrooms were far away from the entry. Actually, bedrooms in traditional Japanese houses were closer to the entry. The more public the room, the further they were from the entry. So when you enter a traditional Japanese home, the housewife would come and, and sit there and welcome you. And then you would walk all the way through the corridor to the farthest room in the house, proving that you're the most important guest. So again, notion of time. And how do you create Japanese activity? By bringing in impermanent furniture. You bring in beobu screens, you bring in little tables, you make activity. The room becomes a living room, and after the activity is done, you clean the furniture again, the room becomes something else. The room is a kind of an antimatter, a kind of a fleeting moment that is right there for an activity you want to create right now, and then it changes again. And the same thing is about celebrating time in temples. When you go to a temple like the Kiyomizudera or the Kinkakuji, uh, you never see the temple as a colossal complex. You never actually come to an entrance like the Acropolis in Greece and see the entire thing at once. The, the, the idea of an entire complex is never shown to you. So you discover the complex by walking through it, but only through a series of snapshots, which is a celebration of time. It's like a golfer. You know, it's like taking a, a, a series of snapshots of you walking from here to there and then putting them together as a sequence. You only experience the activity, the sequence, not as a single still shot. And then the paradigm changes when a seminal book in the 1950s comes into Japan, written by a Harvard art historian by the name of Siegfried Gideon. It's a book called Space, Comma, Time and Architecture. And, and what it is, is it's a, it's a brilliant history of Western architecture, of how beyond the Renaissance, there were people like Malevich, there were people like uh, Theo van Doesburg, all these artists who were, or Picasso for that example, who were bringing in other conceptions of art and visuality. If you look at Picasso's Guernica, the famous painting by Picasso, who was a, far, a great proponent of Cubism, Cubism essentially is a challenge to the three-dimensional Euclidean idea of Renaissance theory, which is to say, if I'm looking at an object, if I'm painting this projector, why in the world would I paint it the way I see it? Reality is what you make of it. So the way Picasso would paint it is, he would draw the projector from the top, from the bottom, from the side, he would juxtapose all of it. And the basic idea of Guernica is that you're looking at a person from different sides at the same time, you're superimposing them. That's Cubism. If you look at futurism, 
which is the painting of Malevich. Uh, you have this famous lady, I think the painting is called A Nude Walking Down the Staircase. And what's beautiful about it is an abstract painting which shows a woman sort of shape walking down the painting. It's like taking snapshots of a bird flying. And you take snapshots, stills, you know, one after the other, one, two, three, four, five. So it shows the same image coming down the stair which again is a celebration of time. You're not capturing a still moment, you're actually showing motion. When this book, when all these theories began to enter Japan, particularly in the 40s and 50s, a lot of uh, Western architects began to rethink how architecture was going to be done. And one of the key ideas that came out, manifest ideas that got built, was this building. It's a very interesting building. It's called the Nakajin Capsule Tower. It's designed by a famous architect called Kisho Kurokawa. It was designed in 1972. And what is really brilliant about it is uh, it actually tries, tries very hard and I think successfully to create a building that is never permanent in form. So what he does, at least the original idea was that you would, th these were precast, um, precast chambers with a single window that, that the crane would bring and attach to a circular core. And so the, the, the building would be like a beehive every few years you would take a few of them out and attach others and so on and so forth. Well that was the original idea. So a fascinating building that in time would change. But what happened to that building is actually equally fascinating. It never changed. It stayed exactly the way it was. And as a result now it's completely kind of gone down from a real estate standpoint. There's a huge uproar. Uh, the Japanese, the developers want to demolish it and the Western historic preservationists want to keep it because it's an architectural icon. So that's the dilemma of this building. It was a very paradigmatic building in Japanese history. And then the most important celebration of time, the way I see it today, is actually in the neon signage of Shinjuku. Uh, if you go to any of the streets in Japan of these the famous commercial nodes like Shinjuku, Akihabara, and I'll show you some slides in a minute. What you see on all these buildings is this riot of signage. And what's beautiful about this signage is that they, they are all, they are the signs of screens and all kinds of electronic signage on these lattices that are continuously behind the buildings. But what that does, in other words, is negates architecture the way we know it. The, the aesthetic of a building completely disappears. It doesn't matter what style it is. What, the only thing that matters is this signage that's completely ephemeral. You take out the signage and you change it again. It's a kind of what I call psychedelic consumerism. Japan, which is quite the antithesis of another kind of tradition, which we have, have to embrace for what it is. The next chapter is a tribute to one of my favorite books on Japan, 1933. Famous Japanese literary uh, author, scholar Junichiro Tanizaki wrote a beautiful book called In Praise of Shadows. It's called Inerai San. Uh, a lot of imports were coming into Japan at that time. And one of the imports was the incandescent bulb. And Tanizaki was lamenting the changing Japan and he used the incandescent bulb as a metaphor to discuss something quite beautiful. He said, you know, in our tradition we've never had bright light. Japanese, architect Japanese light is, if, if western light was the brilliance of the sun, then Japanese light is the tranquility of the moon. Because all our light was made of kerosene wicks in lanterns and they were always placed on the ground and the ceilings were always left to darkness. And every time you sit in a room like this, which is very quiet and calm, your voice goes down and creates a kind of atmosphere of meditative reverie. And all of a sudden, we're now seeing blasting of light in Japan. And so he wrote a book called In Praise of Shadows, which kind of praised and reminded the people of the cultural erosion that was going on. So this is my tribute to an architectural tribute to that lovely essay, which calls out the various ways in which Japan has celebrated darkness, shadows, the most beautiful one for me is uh, the, 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 the mask of the no drama. If you look at the mask of a no drama, watch what happens to it as the light changes. And this is how, if you've seen the no drama, this is what happens. The, or the actor wears the mask. This is ancient Shinto uh, temple dramas. And they happen in darkness because they're usually done at night. And there's a stage and the actors come out with absolutely minimal music. And there's a person sitting with a lantern who changes the incidence of the light on the actors' faces to create various expressions. It's a very beautiful, sublime form of art. And the point I make is that Japanese have had very different conceptions of relationship between form, light, and space. If you do an analysis of uh, buildings in the West versus buildings in Japan, this is the, this is the Pantheon in Rome. 
If you look at it in the day, of course, you have the famous oculus that brings in light. If you look at it at night, you know, there's a space that is absolutely low. Uh, if you look at the Shatras Cathedral, this is the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Same thing, you have, lamp, you have these gigantic lamps. So in the day, you can see the whole volume. In the night, the space is low. Shatras Cathedral, same thing. But if you look at Japan, even the biggest temple in Japan, Todaiji, it's actually the same thing, where there's, a, there's, there's absolutely nothing to celebrate the volume of this space. Never been. So spaces in Japan have always been low and horizontal. They've never celebrated volume in architecture. If you stand in this space and look up, you can see the beams, but they're not celebrated like the great Gothic arches that you say, my goodness, this is a you know, celestial scale of incredible majesty is not there in Japan. The true Japanese equivalent, if, if, if the West has glass, the Japan has shoji which is this beautiful washi screen of light paper that brings in diffused light. And there's a very peculiar relationship that Japanese architecture has had with gold, because gold has a very peculiar relationship with darkness. If you darken the room and you wear gold, you know, gold sort of absorbs every photon possible. It's just, it just creates this glint of... Uh, and this is my favorite uh, interior in Japan. This is a very less known temple, which many scholars surprisingly have missed. It's a famous temple in Kyoto called the Sanju San Gendo. It is the longest wooden building in Japan. What's brilliant about it is as you go in, there are 1,001 statues of the goddess Kannon. In the center is a gigantic statue gilded in gold, and around the central statue are 500 statues, and another 500 on this side. And you can imagine standing in this completely dark, dusky interior, taking in this absolute gilded statue. There's no building interior like this anywhere in the world. And gold and darkness have been a very interesting theme that Japanese interiors have played with. And then I end the, the book with an anecdote which uh, happens in the life of Junichiro Tanizaki when, you know, circa 1960, Japan discovers neon and everything changes. And uh, the, the glimmer of the, the faint light of the lantern is now displaced by the glare of neon. And the funny part is, uh, Junichiro Tanizaki and his wife want to design a home and so they hire a Japanese architect and the architect proudly comes to their house and says don't worry Mr. Tanizaki I have read your book I know exactly what you want and Tanizaki gets up and says absolutely not I do not want to live in a dark house uh, and so the point he makes is it's a very beautifully written book translated of course equally beautifully it says you know although I've myself advocated for the darkness of traditional Japan we must accept the fact that Japan is changing. Uh, and so he himself agrees that although I love the traditional darkness of Japan, I don't want to live in a gloomy house. I want to live in a house just like the West. And so that's where it ends. The seventh essay is a tribute to Kyoto, which I consider to be the greatest city in Japan. Tokyo is not the greatest. Uh, in my opinion, Kyoto is the greatest because it has a thousand years of Japanese history, a thousand years of indisputed uh, collection of every epoch that happened in Japan. When, uh, when you have a place that serves as a capital of a, of a nation, a society of a thousand turbulent years, a lot of material gets gathered. And what I do is, for symbolic reasons, I view it from what in the West has become the absolute stereotypical epicenter of Western civilization, which is Rome. Uh, you know, if you haven't been to Rome, you're not considered an architect. I mean, it's that bad. So, so I, I thought for symbolic reasons, it'll be nice to sort of create a tension between saying, if Rome is for the West, you know, there's another city that deserved equal attention in Japan, if not the rest of Asia, and that is Kyoto. Because it really, in my opinion, had one of the most elegant cultures and most refined cultures that would be comparable to anything that's the best in the world. So it gets into the history of Kyoto and the form and how it came to be. It then gets into some amazing moments that you never thought possible. What if I told you that Michelangelo's most complete sculpture, the famous Pietà, was built and was completed in the exact same year as the famous Zen garden of Ruanji, 1499. So here you have a Zen monk by the name of Somi creating this beautiful garden, and you have Michelangelo chiseling away in Italy doing his beautiful marble sculpture. And what's so beautiful about it is they're both sculptural pieces of art. They are representations of how great thinkers think of humanism and the existential questions of humanism. And what is so contrasting about them is it, Somi 
The whole agenda of Somi is to emulate nature to the absolute degree possible. So in other words, it's not about man's superiority with nature, it's about man's ability to capture the essence of nature in as beautifully a way as nature has. So he collects rocks and doesn't touch them. He doesn't chisel the rock, he doesn't do anything. He literally places a composition of rocks in this garden. Michelangelo, on the other hand, does something else. He actually accepts the idea, embraces the idea, the human perfection of nature that creates the existential question. So the Pieta is the most complete rendition of, of this. It's the human form, the human interaction with materiality. And this is a very interesting theme when you look at paintings. If you look at a Renaissance painting, the protagonist of the painting is actually man. You'll see humans and then nature is a background. If you look at Japanese paintings, which obviously come from Chinese paintings, most of them actually dominated by nature. And man is this tiny little man or woman fishing down the brook. You can barely see them lost in the mist somewhere in the bamboo. And this is another one. In, uh, in 1748, uh, Italian surveyor Giova Battista Noli does a famous plan for Rome. It's called the Noli plan. It's a very famous plan. That's the Pantheon right there. At the exact same time, uh, people in Kyoto are doing mappings of Kyoto. But while they're both mappings of cities, you can see the prioritization. I mean, in the case of the West, in this case, Renaissance Rome, the priority is the morphological precision of the city. You're capturing exactly the size of the squares, the aerial precision. You're trying to understand the city as an anatomical construct. When you look at how the Kyotoites did it, they're not interested in the anatomy of the city. In fact, the city is shrouded by clouds. What they are interested is in the place they experience the fleeting nature of a city. So again, very different ideas. And then it ends with the idea that Kyoto has changed and it has to answer very difficult questions about heritage, particularly in a timber culture. In 1998, Kyoto's biggest building gets built, which is the Kyoto Station. It's a 10-story building, which has six floors underground. A gigantic escalator leads you to the top. And this building, I spoke to many of my friends around there, had a very interesting moment in, to in Kyoto. When it came, there was an uproar in Kyoto, which is a beautiful heritage city. It's almost like a world heritage city. And you have a monstrosity that comes there. Uh, and, and it is a monstrosity in the physical sense. But what it does is for many of the youth, particularly the young people, it actually allows them a place to express themselves in a way that the rest of the city doesn't. So the book gets into very complex issues about how Kyoto needs to deal with these realisms of the choice it has to make or what kind of a city it wants to be eventually. It essay gets into the Japanese street. Now this is an important topic because in, unlike Western public space, which centered around plazas, there was never a plaza in Japan. There was never a plaza in Asia. There was never a plaza in China. So what were the public spaces in Japan? The bottom line is they were streets. But the nice thing, the interesting thing about Japanese streets is unlike the Western street, which had a stone edge, the Japanese street had a wooden edge. So they could be opened and closed. And so a street that looked like this at night could look like this in the day and could look like this during a festival. And so it's a sort of malleable street. And then the history of how these streets change as the Western influences begin to come in. You can see Ginza with the trolleys in the, in the, in the middle. You can see uh, uh, the chapter gets into pointing out the few surviving streetscapes that today exist and give you a whiff of nostalgia. And they get into the modern streetscapes that are now coming into Japan and uh, expressing new forms of public life. The ninth essay is called The Western Genome in Japanese Architecture. This is a very interesting one because you can see right there versus there. This is in Roppongi. Uh, 1958, Japan breaks the height barrier of all these buildings by building its first major radio tower. Now, unabashedly, it is done in the profile of the Eiffel Tower, painted white and red. I love this part about Japan. It's unabashed. It's like there's no qualms about it. We want the Eiffel Tower right in the middle, juxtaposed against uh, Mount Fuji. And, and so it gets into the history of how westernization comes into Japan, all the way from the Diet Building to the, to the, the Museum of Metropolitan Art. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's first major project in Japan, the Imperial Hotel, now demolished, Le Corbusier's building, the entire panoramic history of where this, and then what's so fascinating, bring us back to home, is how these now begin to revert cross influences back to us in the Western world. And we have two great examples in Los Angeles, which are quite underestimated and not talked about as much as they should be. 
You know, the Gamble House right here in Pasadena, the Green and Green Brothers made absolutely no qualms about the fact that they were influenced by Japan. They wrote about it. They loved it. Uh, and, and so the whole idea of uh, massive projecting roofs, 28 kinds of, 48 actually, 48 different kinds of woods, uh, and, and there's a general aesthetic of lifting buildings, making them more elegant, horizontal, is a tribute to the great forms of ancient temples of Japan. Not by me saying it, but the, by the Greens endorsing it that way. But one building that I think has escaped attention, and that I think calls out, and I encourage you to go and see it, is the famous King's Road House, designed by Rudolf Schindler. Uh, it's actually on King's Road near Melrose. It is, I think, one of the most beautiful houses in Los Angeles. And uh, what, is, what is so beautiful about these two buildings together is that while the Gamble House is Japanese in form, it is not Japanese in space at all. If you go on the inside, it's an American bungalow. But if you go to the Schindler House, it's not Japanese in form. On the outside, it looks like a modern house, but it's actually very Japanese in space. The way it relates to nature, the way there are no steps between the outside and the inside, the way the horizontal roof connects, the way there are no curves, but you actually experience the compositions frontally as if you were going through Katsura Villa. It's actually quite amazing. So we dig more into this. Uh, uh, Schindler never visited Japan. We think that it was his apprenticeship with Frank Lloyd Wright that gave him insights into Japanese culture. There was never a note in any of Schindler's archives, which I've investigated thoroughly, uh, of any kind of mention of Japan, and yet uh, this building, in my opinion, could have served as an enormously important reference point when Japan was undergoing westernization. And this is where I feel so sad about how the West has misunderstood Japan and also created wrong influences in Japan. In, 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 in the 1920s, I think it was, uh, there was a very famous international exhibition that was being held in MoCA in New York. Uh, it was being curated by Philip Johnson, who's a very famous modern architect, American architect. And it was called the International Style. And what was International Style was a distinct emerging style with absolutely straight lines and no curves. And just a, it was a school of thought of modern architecture. And so uh, Philip Johnson made an excursion all over the country, came to LA to select the best examples of the International Style. And he selected the houses of Richard Neutra, but he did not select the King's Road House, because he felt it did not cater to the authentic uh, aesthetic of the Western international style, which I lament in the book, because I think that if he had picked it up, this would have gone to Japan and be known to the rest of the world, including Japan, and would have influenced Japan in positive ways. What happens when a Western major figure says that this doesn't matter is that it's not known. And this house only came into limelight circa 1970. And these are, these are the destinies of, of many of these great pieces of architecture. Again, gets into these amazing buildings that Japanese architects produce. Tadao Ando's famous Church of the Light, uh, all the way to the Todd's building by, by uh, Toyo Ito. And then finally, co sort of gets into the second last chapter where it talks about public space, where you have this another paradigmatic moment when Western democracy enters Japan, actually enters Asia for the first time. So in 1947, uh, the war is over. Japan is a prostrate nation. Tokyo, more than 50% of Tokyo is completely destroyed. The famous castle in Tokyo has been reduced to a heap of rubble. And the American occupation consciously insinuates in Japan the first democracy, Western democracy. There's no other Asian country at that time where Western democracy is there. They're just a series of monarchies. So Japan becomes the first industrialized Western democracy in the world. And that's an amazing thing to think about because a culture where the emperor or the divinity of the emperor has been at the prime or the sort of social fulcrum, you now have an entire other form of governance which brings in other expectations. And so what does this mean for publicness? And so the Hiroshima Park in 1950 becomes the first public space designed in Japan. There are other public spaces like parks but those are not public spaces where you can come and express yourself. They're just spaces for recreation. The first real consciously designed space, democratic symbol, is actually Hiroshima. But it's also flawed, as the book calls out, because uh, the, the, the biggest problem that happens in the, in the memorial is people, by law, are not allowed to mourn aloud. They are not allowed to cry. So you, you can come to the park, you can sit there, but you're not allowed to express yourself. And so it gets into this nuanced topic of how, although it's democracy, it's not really democracy in the sense as the West knows it, and gets into all these issues.
uh, gets into buildings, the entire history of how democratic symbolism begins to come in. In the 1990s, Tokyo City Hall gets rebuilt through a competition. And this eventually wins the day. Uh, and this is today known as the Gothic Cathedral of Japan. So again, an unabashedly Western symbol of Japan. Great piece of architecture and engineering, but very Western in its conception, consciously. And then there comes this moment where Japan becomes the world's leading proponent of theme parks. So I, in my book, I call it Mickey Mouse meets Godzilla. And all of a sudden, you have this amazing negotiation between Disney and all these people who Japan passes a new law called the Recreation Law, primarily to boost its economy. And as a result, you have a plethora of uh, theme parks, thousands and thousands of them. The pinnacle of them is, of course, Tokyo Disneyland. It gets into the morphology of Tokyo Disneyland. It's actually 10 times the size of the American one in Anaheim. Uh, but democracy prevails and it manifests itself in many forms. And in the last chapter, I reread Tokyo. I began at Issei, and now I go into what I consider to be the ultimate crescendo of Japan, which is Tokyo. And when you look at Tokyo, any Westerner, so many people, Westerners, scholars, anthropologists, have been titillated by Tokyo. And I don't blame them because compared to Western cities, Tokyo is. Uh, quite an anomaly when you look at it from a comparative standpoint. So for example, statistically speaking, compared to European and American cities, Tokyo does present some startling contrasts. The cost of living is more than 50% higher than New York. The amount of private space per capita is 66% lower than New York. Parks constitute merely 5% of its land surface in comparison to 30% in London. But despite these delirious densities, the amount of space actually occupied by over its 9 million occupants on its 622 square kilometers spread is only around 52%. That's kind of shocking. What that means is because it's such a mountainous region, there are only very selective parts in Tokyo that can be built on. So it's a very interesting city. I was asked in a recent interview which city I would return to again and again as a le for lessons as an architect and planner, and I said it was Tokyo. And so I, I, like a flaneur, I, in this final essay, I sort of tell the reader why I think Tokyo is something to be taken very seriously for all of us today. Because when you look at it from the point of view of Los Angeles, and you compare the evolutions of these two cities, you realize the, the, this is population, the red. This is the size of Los Angeles versus Tokyo. And this is the population. And the size of the square actually represents the density. It's proportional to the density of the amount of land they live on. And while we in Los Angeles love to think that we are among the densest metropolitan regions in the world, which we are, when you look at it from the point of view of Tokyo, it really pales what we're saying. Now, why is this important? Because when you look at transit, when you look at the density of transit in Tokyo, it also pales transit in Los Angeles. Which means that all the principles that we espouse to today, great access to public transit, you know, compact cities, mixed use, density, it's all right there in Tokyo. Why then does Tokyo look this way? And that's what I challenge. Because I think the notion that a city looks chaotic is a programmed construct of the Western mind. Because we in the West, I think, are very used to seeing you know, ex beautifully regulated cities, cities where streets are, every house is planned, almost over-regulated. You have to go through three planning commissions and two city councils to get a small 20-unit condo built, and yet it doesn't look very nice, so, and so on and so forth. So the point is, how do we change our programming to understand cities like this? And this is where the answer lies. When you look at the history of Tokyo, it is unlike any other city in the world. If you, if you did a mapping of the growth of any other city practically in the world, it would start like this, and then it would keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. But when you look at the mapping of Tokyo, it starts as a little castle town. It grows, and then there's a massive earthquake. And almost half the city is destroyed. And then it gets built again with a different grid. And then it, gets gro it grows again, and there's another massive earthquake. And it get, gets filled again. And another massive earthquake is filled again, filled again. The point is, how would you think if you lived in a city that you know will be destroyed from time to time? And I find that absolutely fascinating. So I call Tokyo 
a city with the thrill of uncertainty. It is a kind of a unique Zen notion, if you think about it. You know, it's a beautiful Zen haiku. It says, like a leaf in the wind, I thrill in the joy of my own uncertainty, because the leaf doesn't know when it's going to fall. And in many ways, Tokyo is a city like that. Every Tokyoite, no matter how crazy these statistics may seem to you and me, for an everyday Tokyoite, they mean absolutely nothing. Life goes on in Tokyo incredibly wonderfully. Tokyo is walkable, Tokyo is livable, Tokyo is efficient. Tokyo may be ugly to some of us. I find it utterly beautiful because there are unexplored sides of Tokyo that need to be understood as phenomena, not necessarily as form only. And that's the meta thesis this book makes. For example, because of the scarcity of land, here's an analysis of the size of lots, individual lots. And I know you cannot see it very clearly, but most of the lots on these streets in Shinjuku range from 10 feet in width to 30 feet in width. And the buildings actually look like this. You, you can see it right there. It would be unthinkable, illegal in the United States. But happens in Japan because of another constraint. And then the book ends with some very important phenomena that go unnoticed in Tokyo, which really make it an ordinary city, just like anything else, gripping, gripping with its own dilemmas. The first one is homelessness. Homelessness is on the rise with the collapse of the economic bubble. There are about 10,000 homeless in Tokyo alone, a growing number in the rest of Japan. And you know, compared to where I come from in India, this number means absolutely nothing. But for Japan, it means a lot. Because Japan has never encountered this kind of policy slash social justice issue. And um, I have a lot of personal quips between the chapters in this book, just to break the ice for the reader. And one of the quips uh, is one of a very touching moment that uh, my, my former student Yoko, who's sitting there, and I had together when we were walking in Shinjuku. We chanced by a homeless man. And you, you're always warned not to disturb the homeless because they don't like it. But somehow we made friends with him, and he invited us to his house. And uh, he took us and he told us his whole story. He was sitting under the Japan railway tracks. And what he's done is there's a policy in Japan where if you're homeless, the government actually gives you a stipend of the equivalent of $400 a month or something, like 400 yen, I forget what it is. Anyway, he and his friends uh, have refused that stipend and have chosen to open their own business. And every day they walk through the streets of, Sh of Sh Shinjuku, Shibuya actually, and they collect beer cans and they sell it every Thursday to make about one third of that stipend. And uh, you know, he cried when he told us his story. He told us what happened, how he misses his family, and so on and so forth. So in my, in my, uh, in my chapter, I actually, in the, in the little quip I have here, I mentioned that in, for me, in Shibuya's seductive terrain of eros and pleasure, that where everyone tends to hide from the real world, uh, Nishizawa, which is his name, and his friends I call the last samurais alive. Because what he said to me, which stays with me, is that he, he told Yoko and I, he said, we would rather die under the Japan train tracks than accept money from the government. Which actually warmed my heart because it was kind of this incredible samurai spirit of deep pride in saying, you know, I will not give in to just a simple way of doing things. This may be an exaggeration, maybe it was an exception, I don't know. But I went through it, so I wrote about it. Anyway, but homelessness is a, is a phenomenon that Japan has to deal with. And then finally, a, a, an issue which completely titillates many foreigners, particularly starry-eyed foreigners, which is Japan's sex culture. Uh, so many books written on Japan's sex industry. Uh, there's a famous book by David Schlockum. Uh, there's another one by uh, Stephen Barber. Beautiful books, very, very provocatively written. And um, what, I, what I simply say here is, when I finished the manuscript for the first time, I sent it to three of my most trusted colleagues in Japan. And all three of them slammed me on this last part. And so I changed it. And the slamming was consistent. They said, you are being a starry-eyed foreigner. You are not a starry-eyed foreigner. Why? Because I too was getting absolutely titillated about love hotels in Japan. I don't know if you know what love hotels are, but this is amazing zoning in Japan where you're allowed to actually, by right, do something called a love hotel. A love hotel is a building where, you know, it's kind of kitschy on the outside typically. Uh, they're usually found in the back alleys of, they're never on the main road, they're often in the back alleys. So you go through, and there's a famous hill in, in Tokyo, a love hotel hill. You go in, there's a bunch of love hotels. And outside right there is a little machine. 
that tells you that there are all these rooms with various finishes. One is medieval, one is gothic, whatever you want. And you can pay X number of yen, and consenting couples can go for about an hour or more and enjoy themselves and come out. It's a very fascinating part of that culture. And then there is, of course, uh, in Shinjuku, uh, a famous all kinds of sex trade, the Yakuza are involved. So there's a, the whole other side. The point I'm making in this book is, ultimately, it's what every city is made of. I think, I think the whole idea of exaggerating Tokyo is, is to me, a Western construct. So I end my book with, with this last paragraph. So Tokyo, then, is an urban phenomenon where the term disaster translates into cyclical occurrence, where the term chaos translates into, a, into an order to be deciphered, and where the term density translates into a mechanism for survival. Tokyo's perception as an extreme city is a Western construct, an exaggeration that is born out of a comparative bias from the standpoint of the European and American polis. If, therefore, we as outsiders can shift our perceptions on reading Tokyo on its own terms, it may offer us significant takeaways to question our own preconceptions on what cities are or ought to be. I, for one, have not failed to notice the bowing ticket collector in the Shinkansen bullet train. And I have admired as much the vista from the grounds of the Sensoji Temple in Asakusa, juxtaposing its curved roof with a love hotel in the distance. This is why in Tokyo, my narrative ends as it naturally began in Ise. Because I have journeyed to Japan's cultural extremes. Because I do not need to search for cultural threads anymore. Ise and Tokyo are in their own way equally Japanese, and they will always be, because there is nothing like them anywhere else in the world. Thank you.